Hi everyone. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties in the lecture section, so I'm going to re-record this lecture. I do realize that we'll have some different wording, and I apologize in advance for you not getting to uh, look at my face while we're going through this, but we'll all just have to suffer through it together. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about the electrical activity that goes on in neurons. Today it's about the resting membrane potential. Uh, in other words, when the neuron isn't doing anything and Thursday, or I suppose for you all Friday, we'll be talking about action potentials. Um, what neurons do whenever they are actively communicating. Subsequent lectures will talk about neurotransmitter release and the ion channels that they affect. But for right now, we're going to first introduce ion channels and then how the activity of these various leak ion channels that are always open create the resting membrane potential. Uh, there was a question of whether or not we can go over an example of how to solve a Nernst equation, and of course we can do that. Uh, we will do that um, in class tomorrow. So we will, and I'll show you uh, the equation. It's actually very straightforward. There's also a spreadsheet in Practicum 2 on the class website. Um, we'll use that on Monday. So we will be going through Nernst equations. When we're talking about the movement of ions, it's all about ion channels. Now there are also transporters and pumps that move ions but you suffer about a thousand-fold decrease in the rate of ion flux. So for every million ions that a channel will move, a transporter will move a thousand, and a pump will move about one. So when we're considering ion movement, we should just think of channels. And ions will move across the membrane because every neuron, uh, or every cell has what we call a membrane potential, and that's just the charge at the membrane. And for your textbook neuron, it's going to be minus 70 millivolts. Uh, the reason for this has to do with the imbalance of ions on both sides of the membrane. On the left, we can see a table uh, showing us this imbalance for each specific ion. For potassium, that'd be K+, plus, we see that there's a higher concentration inside than out. For sodium and chloride, um, that's Na and Cl there, we see that the concentrations are much higher outside than in. Calcium on the bottom, of course, has very low concentrations uh, throughout, but it's higher outside than in. You can remember these um, by first thinking, let's start, let's start at the bottom, let's first think about calcium. Very low concentration inside because when you have an increase in intracellular calcium concentrations for any appreciable amount of time, the neuron dies. We're going to create mitochondrial transition pores. And we can also form insoluble uh, salt crystals with phosphates. So calcium phosphate will form in the high millimolar concentrations. So we keep ca calcium very low. Sodium and chloride are low inside because we were born in the ocean. Not us, but life uh, originated in salt water. Salt would be, of course, sodium chloride. And so to distinguish the first cell from the outside world, that cell pumped out sodium and chloride. So sodium and chloride are high outside because life was born in the sea. And then to make up for these differences in concentrations where sodium, chloride, and calcium are high outside, well, something has to be higher inside, and that would be potassium. Because you can't have this overall imbalance in osmolarity. If there's too much stuff dissolved, if the cell is hyperosmotic, then, then water will rush in, the cell will swell, eventually bursting. If there's not enough stuff dissolved in the cell, well, water will leave, and the cell will shrivel, and neither of these options are good for the cell. The illustration on the right is showing you uh, the lining up of charges on both sides of the membrane there, where it gets lined with positive and negative charge on the outside and inside. So membrane potential is very local. 
and we'll discuss that uh, throughout this lecture. Now the reason that cells are biased toward a negative membrane potential has to do with uh, what we call impermeable anions or negatively charged molecules that can't cross the membrane. These would be your phosphates um, which are attached to DNA and proteins and things that shouldn't just leak out. So the fact that the cell has a lot of phosphate inside of it uh, is going to bias it toward a negative membrane potential and also explain why we keep calcium levels so low. Now these, these charge imbalances um, are going to create movements of ions uh, whenever they're allowed to permeate the membrane. And the way that ions move across the membrane is through ion channels. The membrane itself has a hydrophobic core. That would be the purple region of uh, these cartoon membranes on the right. And it doesn't matter the size. Even protons are going to be blocked from moving across the membrane because of that hydrophobic core. So if ions are going to pass through the membrane, they need a hole to move through. And that's what we would call the ion pore. And every ion channel has this. The ion pore is going to let water and ions move through the membrane. It's going to contain uh, a series of amino acids that we call the selectivity filter. Uh, these are going to directly interact with the ion itself or with the sphere of hydration around the ion, so with the water molecules that come along for the ride. And this will help select ions that are the correct size and charge. Some ion pores are going to have selectivity filters that just let any old cation through. They're called nonspecific ion channels. Others will select for only sodium or potassium or calcium. So every ion has to have an ion pore and a selectivity filter. Then there are two optional components. These are what we call gates. Uh, we think of the membrane as a fence uh, through which ions can't move. Uh, they can only move through gates. There's no jumping the fence allowed here. The optional gates can either be activation or inactivation. And so when these, when these gates are stimulated, activation gates will open the ion pore. So they're shown in green here on this cartoon. And when something happens, uh, whether it be the lining, uh, binding of a ligand or a change in membrane potential, that's going to open the ion pore. The inactivation gate is going to block the pore. These are more rare than activation gates. Most of the ion channels that we'll talk about in this class um, have activation gates. Today is the exception. It's all about leak channels which don't have activation or inactivation gates. But for the rest of the class, all of our ion channels are going to have activation gates. So you need a neurotransmitter to bind, for example. Um, in our next lecture, Voltage-gated sodium channels have inactivation gates. Beyond that, we, we won't hear about inactivation gates again. But even if the activation gate is open, the inactivation gate blocks the ion channel, so you don't get any movement of ions. Now, the activation gates are going to come in two flavors. They can be ligand-gated, where the binding of some small molecule, in this case a red ball, uh, opens up the ion pore. So if you look at the top, that ligand-gated ion channel, after the ligand binds, it's going to have its activation gate pull open the ion pore, and ions can move through the membrane. What we'll be talking about in the next lecture are voltage-gated ion channels that respond to a change in membrane potential. They will have charged amino acids in their activation gate that will rearrange after the, after the membrane potential changes. So when the neuron is resting at a negative potential, this causes the, neg the, the positively charged amino acids to rest in a certain conformation. When the neuron depolarizes, they open up and ions can move through the membrane. These ions will move in accordance with two forces. Uh, the first being the diffusive force, which is just based on concentration. Random motion is going to bring movement is going to bring ions from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So sodium and chloride will want to rush in, potassium will want to rush out of the cell based on the diffusive force. And we can see that in uh, summarized by the, the blue arrow in this illustration. The orange arrow would be the electrical force or the electromotive force. This is based on the ion's charge. The neuron has a negative membrane potential, so 
sodium and potassium, which have positive charge, will be pulled into the cell and chloride will be pushed out. Sometimes these forces agree, like in sodium. Sodium is going to be pushed in based on the diffusive force and the electromotive force. Potassium, on the other hand, has conflicting forces. It's going to be pulled in based on its charge, but pushed out based on its concentration. How do we know which one wins? Well, we'll get to that. First, I think it's important for us to appreciate that the diffusive force is going to be constant. It will never change. The only thing that will change is the electrical force. If everything is working properly, the diffusive force is constant. First, because ion flux is incredibly local. So let's look at this illustration in part A. This is showing you the area where ions move near the membrane. So look at the bottom. This is a typical cell body. We're just turning it into a little circle here. And you can, you can see the area of red surrounding its lipid bilayer. Of course you can't. Uh, I'm lying to you. You have to zoom in quite a bit to see that area of red. And that's what the top is showing you, a blow up of that lipid bilayer because it's only within a few nanometers that we have ion flux. But cells are in the size of microns. Part B is showing us the function of ion movement, shown on the y-axis, based on the distance from the membrane. So as you move away from the membrane, you no longer have 100% ion flux very few of those ions actually move across the membrane. By the time you reach about four nanometers away, you're at about 5% of those ions that actually escape the membrane or move into the cell. So ion flux is very local. Uh, so the overall concentration of ions is largely unaffected whenever we open ion channels. And in the long run, it remains unaffected because of pumps because we spend ATP to, to export that sodium that rushes in or bring back in the potassium that leaves the cell. And we spend a considerable amount of our ATP on this process. We spend about one-fifth of all of the neurons ATP to maintain ionic imbalance. So it's not the diffusive force that changes. Instead, it's the electromotive force that's going to change as membrane potential changes. And remember, membrane potential is incredibly local, just within a few nanometers of the membrane. So let's consider what's happening on the right here when we open a sodium channel. So sodium at rest, when we're at minus 70 millivolts, sodium has consistent forces acting on it. The diffusive force pushes sodium in because the cell is negatively charged, and the electrical force, I'm sorry, because there's a lot of sodium outside that pushes sodium in, and the electrical force pushes sodium in because the cell has a negative charge. As sodium rushes in, this makes the membrane potential more positive. If we see what's happening at, at zero millivolts, so after some sodium has rushed in, we lose our membrane potential, we're now at zero. The diffusive force is constant, that's still pushing sodium in, so we still get an influx of sodium, and the electrical force is now gone. The cell is neither attractive nor repulsive to sodium because there's no charge. As sodium continues to rush in, the cell adopts a positive membrane potential, and so the electrical force starts to push sodium out of the cell. And this continues until the membrane potential reaches what we call equilibrium potential or reversal potential. Uh, they're the same thing. And that's the membrane potential at which the electrical force offsets the diffusive force. So now you have no net flux of that ion. Sodium still moves through any open sodium channel, but there's no appreciable movement in any given direction. Just as much sodium comes in as leaves, because there's no net force acting on it. From this we can see that when you open an ion channel, that ion is going to continue to move across the membrane there's going to be a net flux of that ion until the membrane potential becomes the reversal potential for that ion. So it's really important to understand reversal potentials and to be able to calculate them.
Of course, you won't do this by hand. You should never calculate anything, but you can use a spreadsheet to accomplish this. You can find this spreadsheet on the class website in Practicum 2. We'll be using this on Monday. We can also use this in class. What it does is automatically solve the Nernst equation for you. Um, the Nernst equation is written out in the top right of the slide. We can make a few assumptions to simplify this because there are a few constants. The gas constant and Faraday's constant never change. And if we assume body temperature, then temperature will never change. When we combine all of those, you can see a simplified version of the Nernst equation written in the middle of the screen on the right. We'll just simply take 61.5 divided by whatever the charge of the ion is. For potassium and sodium, it's positive 1. For chloride, it's negative 1. And for calcium, it's positive 2. And we will multiply that by the log base 10 of the ratio of the ion concentration outside versus inside. So for something like potassium that has a higher concentration inside than out, we can see that the, the log of that is going to give us a negative value because the log of any fraction of one or any decimal is going to give you a negative value. So our, our reversal potential for potassium is going to be thus negative. And in fact, if you solve for it, you'll find it's negative 102. While chloride has a higher concentration outside than in, its negative charge is going to give it an overall negative reversal. Again, we'll go through this in class. It'll make a little more sense then. But all you need to know are those three things, the concentration of the ion outside and inside and its charge. And when you look at this, what you should see is that the Nernst equation is based off of the diffusive force. That's the difference between your concentration outside and in. And by knowing the diffusive force and the charge of the ion, we can then convert that into the membrane potential needed to offset that diffusive force. I've plotted the reversal potentials on the bottom. On the left, we have negative membrane potentials going from red, uh, which is negative, on up to green, which is positive as you move to the right. And I've shown you a zero right there in the middle. So you can see these reversals plotted uh, relative to the resting membrane potential, assuming it's minus 70. And what you want to think about is that whenever you increase the permeability of the membrane for each of these ions, they're going to pull the membrane potential toward their reversal potential. In other words, they're going to move, there's going to be a net flux of ions until the membrane potential reaches their reversal potential. So it's really important to know the rough ballpark for the reversal potential of each ion and to understand that the membrane potential is going to move toward an ion's reversal if you increase permeability to that ion. So knowing the reversal potential allows you to predict the behavior of ions. One of the things that it will tell you is the direction of flow. For example, an anion here is going to flow out of the cell if the reversal potential is more positive than the current membrane potential. So if you look on this plot here, the membrane potential is shown in the X, the movement of ions is shown in the Y. This is not the same thing as the current you would measure, but it is related. So if we look at the salmon colored uh, dashed line there, that's the movement of an ion. And at the reversal potential, there's no net movement. It doesn't move inward, it doesn't move outward. If our membrane potential is more negative than reversal, that ion is going to flow out of the cell to bring the membrane potential to its reversal. If we are more positive than its reversal potential, the anion will flow into the cell to hyperpolarize the membrane potential and bring it toward its reversal. And the same thing is true for cations. 
that purple dashed line is showing you the IV relation or the sorry the current potential relationship for sodium. So at sodium's reversal, no net flux of ions. When we're more negative than sodium's reversal, which the neuron almost always is, sodium flows into the cell to make the membrane potential more positive. So you should notice that as you move away from the ion's reversal potential, we're moving further away from that zero movement of ions. And so we're creating a larger movement of ions as the reversal potential becomes more different from the current membrane potential. And that difference is what we call the driving force. And the driving force is very much related to the net movement of ions. We're going to go back to Ohm's law here, V equals IR. The V that we're talking about is that potential difference, that driving force. So when we're at an ion's reversal potential, there is no driving force, and thus there is no net current. The further we are from that ion's reversal potential, the greater the current that we get. And this is why we get such robust calcium influx at presynaptic sites, even though they're fairly depolarized. It's because calcium reverses at such positive potentials. All right, take a moment here and see if you can answer these. Okay, moving on. The resting membrane potential is going to be uh, determined by all of the passive ion conductances. Um, so that would be mostly the leak channels. Pumps are important for establishing the resting membrane potential, but the instantaneous membrane potential is based on which leak channels are there in the cell. All neurons have leak channels. Some have a different composition than others, giving them different resting membrane potentials. But we need to think about leak channels when we're talking about resting membrane potential, because when we're resting, we're not doing anything. We don't have uh, neurotransmitter input. We're not firing action potentials. So the activation gates on any gated ion channel will remain closed. The only ion pores that are open are those that aren't gated. So this, these have to be the leak channels. And these vary from cell to cell. Um, you can calculate the resting membrane potential using the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation, which looks more complicated than it really is. This is just a weighted average of three Nernst equations. You can see we took the Nernst equation for potassium, sodium, and chloride, and just put them all together. To account for the difference in charge, chloride's positions got flipped so that inside is in the numerator and outside is in the denominator. That's going to flip the sign of what we get from any log. So that accounts for the difference in charge. But that's all this is. This is a weighted average. We're going to take the reversal potential for each of those three ions, and we're going to calculate a weighted average based on the permeability of the membrane for each of these. At rest, we're most permeable to potassium. So we assign that the value of 1, and everything else is a fraction of that. So we're only about 4% as permeable to sodium as we are potassium, and we're about 45% as permeable uh, to chloride as we are potassium. So the predominant leak is potassium, and this is why changes in potassium concentration outside the cell can have big impacts on the membrane potential. When we talk about epilepsy, we bring up changes in potassium uh, buffering, not sodium. Even though sodium will strongly depolarize the cell, at rest, cells are very weakly permeable to sodium. So if you'll go on and use the spreadsheet I've given you for practicum 2, you'll see that changes in sodium concentrations don't really affect resting membrane potential that much. Uh, now, if you were to plug and chug here all the values that I've given you throughout this lecture, you'd calculate a resting membrane potential of somewhere around negative 73 millivolts. So it's pretty close to the negative 70 uh, that you see in all the textbooks. We'll assume that this neuron rests at negative 70. And let's see what happens if we were to increase potassium permeability. Take a moment and think about this. And, and remember that the membrane potential is going to be a weighted average of all those reversals based on their permeability. So if you increase the permeability 
of the membrane for a specific ion, the membrane potential will move toward that ion's reversal. Now hopefully you're remembering that potassium is going to reverse somewhere around negative 102 millivolts. And so if we increase the permeability to potassium, that negative 70 millivolt membrane potential is going to become more negative. It's going to hyperpolarize and move closer to potassium's reversal. Now if we increase sodium permeability, the opposite is going to be true because sodium reverses at positive 56. So the membrane potential is going to depolarize and move closer to sodium's reversal. Once we have charge entering the cell, it's going to move around passively. And when we think about charge movement in the membrane, we think of the membrane as an RC circuit or a resistor and capacitor circuit. And that's what the top of this illustration is showing us. This is a hypothetical axon. Um, there's axial resistance moving within the axon, so that's the internal resistance. And then at the membrane we have resistors and capacitors. The resistors would be ion channels. So a resistor is just something that current can move through. The capacitor would be the lipid bilayer. And the reason that the lipid bilayer is a capacitor is because it stores charge. The lipid bilayer is incredibly thin and it's impermeable to ions. So there are ions lining both sides of the membrane and because it's so thin they can actually attract and repel each other. So at rest the intracellular face of the membrane is lined with negative charges. So if we were to open up a sodium channel or as we see in this illustration if we are to inject current that's what that I inject is. They're injecting a square wave of current in part B and you'll notice the membrane potential on top of that doesn't change as a square. There's sort of a smooth depolarization and repolarization that occurs when the current is delivered and removed. And that's because of membrane capacitance. First, we have to charge our membrane. So when positive current flows into the cell, it's first going to be attracted to all those negative charges at the membrane. And it's going to have to charge the membrane. So the more membrane there is in a cell, the more capacitance there is. So larger cells have greater capacitance. And if we know the membrane resistance and capacitance, we can calculate something called tau, which is the amount of time it takes to change the membrane potential by about 63% of its max. Um, the details here don't matter that much. I just want you to understand the, the relationship between capacitance and the rate of membrane uh, potential change. If you have more membrane, you have a larger capacitor, you have to you have to put more charge there to actually charge your capacitor. So you're going to have slower rates of membrane potential change. Smaller neurons, which have less capacitance, are going to have more rapid changes in membrane potential. You can also decrease the membrane capacitance through myelination. And this is why we get such rapid propagation of action potentials with myelination. What that myelin does is spread out the charge inside the axon and the charge in the extracellular fluid. So now the membrane doesn't act as a capacitor. So all the charge that makes it in is free to propagate within the axon. It doesn't remain stored at the membrane. The distance that this charge is going to propagate is described by the space constant lambda. And that's just a function of the membrane resistance divided by the internal resistance. And then we take the square root. Again, the details don't matter, but the general relationship does. If you increase membrane resistance, you have less leak, and so charge can propagate passively over longer distances. If you decrease the membrane resistance and your membrane is leakier, then that charge will dissipate. It's going to flow out of leak channels, and it won't travel as far. So the the ability of charge to propagate passively within a neuron is going to be based on the membrane and internal resistance. You don't need to do any calculations in terms of figuring out how far a charge uh, can propagate passively, but you should appreciate that by making the membrane leakier, 
a neuron can be less sensitive to synaptic input. And sometimes neurons will do this. If they run out of ATP, then they'll open up ATP-gated potassium channels and become leakier. And because they're leaky, they're less excitable. They're going to tend to hang out around rest, so they don't fire action potentials that are going to require more ATP in order to reestablish that resting membrane potential. So these values do change um, over time within the same neuron. All right, go ahead, pause this, take a moment, and try to answer these before moving ahead. That's it for this lecture. We're going to pick up from here and talk about the active conductances in lecture four.